Okay, allow me to invite the next set of guests, which has the challenging uh, goal to keep you awake for the next hour. So, uh, first guest is Phil Evans, Director General at EUMED SAT. Welcome, Phil. You're on my left. Thank you. Our second speaker is Einar Bjorgo, the Director at the United Nations Satellite Center, UNOSAT. Welcome, Einar, please. And our next speaker is Anke Kaiser Pizzalla, the chair of the DLR Executive Board. And please welcome Lionel, Lionel Suchet, the chief operating officer at the Centre National de Tudes Spatial. Bonjour, Lionel. Eric Laliberté, the director at General Space Utilization at the Canadian Space Agency. Bonjour. Bonjour, Lady. And of course, last but not least, you should know him by now, we have Christian Hagleansen, the Director General of the Norwegian Space Agency. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's get started with session three. It's been a very interesting morning. We had several interesting inputs from session one, session two. Allow me to give you a bit of context of how we're going to run this session for you, of course, and for the audience. The first part, we're going to open a bit uh, a dialogue with what has been said before, because we want to pick up on what the end user said. They have needs, they have gaps, they made clear that there are some issues that they need to be tackled. So this is now the occasion from, a pers from the perspective of agencies and public sectors to actually tackle these uh, issues and bring your perspective. So the first part is going to be a bit of uh, um, di dialogue about what has been said before. And then the second part, we're going to move on on the actual title, Space as a Toolbox for Climate Action Now. So the question that I'm going to pose to all of you is how space can actually do something concrete for climate issues. And uh, there are studies that say that when you speak about a problem, why the problem is happening is actually more engaging, so stick with the people more. So allow me to bring a bit of an example from my personal uh, experience. I'm Italian and Last year, Italy went through a one year of 12 months of complete drought. There were 48 degrees in Sicily. And this year, we had in two weeks the rain of two years, okay? And I don't know if you saw the New York Times, there have been floods everywhere in Emilia Romagna, in the central part region. The agricultural lands have been covered with muds. Entire families, entire population have been displaced. What does this mean? This means that the emergency is real and the emergency is now. Study says that in 80 years, Venice is going to be underwater, disappeared. So my question for you is, are we ready for the emergencies? Are we ready to tackle this kind of emergency? Because, of course, today is Venice, <coughs> tomorrow is Houston, and the day after tomorrow is the entire Bangladesh. 170 million people that might be displaced. So climate change, as we said this before, is not just about uh, melting guys. That's just the tip of the iceberg, sorry for the pun. It's going to have incredible socio-economical effects on our society, on human beings, on, cult on culture, on agriculture, on economies. Are we ready to tackle this emergency? Is space ready? Can inform on how we can structure the next emergency? And of course, can we avoid the worst case scenario? Can we inform politicians? Can we inform the community? Can we do actually something concrete that is in our hands to avoid that in 100 years' time we live on a deserted rocks with no biodiversity, no animals, no plants, and we have to displace uh, all the coastal communities to Oklahoma because there is uh, a sea level rise? So this is my question for you. It's a question for you panelists. It's a question for the space community. And my personal opinion is that if 100 years' time we ended up like that, we have not done our job properly today. So the stage is yours. So who want to start to be challenged by me? <laughs> Christian, I'm going to open with you. Uh, we heard from panel two that there are some concrete issues that the end users are, are facing. They made example of like inaccessibility to data, low resolutions data, data that are not tailored to suit the needs of the local communities because, of course, global 
climate change is a global issue that reflects on local communities. So how do you respond? They also uh, highlighted the need to build from the ground up. They don't like the idea that inputs only comes from, from Europe, from the big agencies, and then there is no uh, institutions, no local structures that can actually bring uh, all this data to action. Over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, you know, to start off with uh, two observations, first of all, there was a high degree of consensus, I think, in the high-level panel, too, uh, in the fact that there is a void. Um, uh, the um, the uh, other part of that is that that is kind of discouraging because they all were saying that you know we have a lot of mechanisms we have a lot of data sourcing uh, we have a lot of expertise but somehow we are not able to for different reason to actually reach out we are trying to reach out and with goodwill and I think this is important that uh, we we are not we are all doing this for a good purpose but how this is perceived and received from the potential end user is, is really important to discuss. And I think one, one element that was taken up, and there was many good um, um, comments in the, in the second panel, was the fact that uh, the, the end user, the ones who are actually trying to implement this, they're not necessarily tech expert. The content may be there of the earth observation data or, or the formats or, or the, the procedures, but you need to have something that enables them to actually expedite this. Uh, there was talk on the uh, law enforcement element. I mean, if you're looking at the local communities, how are you actually, even though you have actionable items, how will you transfer that into something that they really will need? So w I'm sure we'll get back to that, but that, that was my first take. There, there is a consensus that there is a void, and, but uh, uh, it's maybe not a consensus how to close that. Thank you. Anke, what do you say? Like, they spoke about a lot of... Uh, detailed uh, technological issues like low, 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 low resolution, accessibility to data. I'm, what is your perspective? Does the DLR tackle some of these issues? What do you think? Yeah, so you just described the emergency currently in Italy, which are really devastating. Um, we had flooding in Germany in the uh, Our Valley, which is um, uh, quite a catastrophe. And uh, we have also had the... Um, fires in the Grunewald, and, uh, uh, and uh, we have all seen the disaster in Turkey, which uh, was not so long ago. Um, those all were, in fact, disasters where space data uh, was um, essential for um, the um, uh, forces that came to the rescue, uh, where space data was also essential in order uh, to really find out um, where you could still pass roads, um, which, which ways you still had to access those in emergency to see, um, for instance, in case of the uh, fires in Grunewald, um, the um, uh, size of the area where, in fact, the fire was, and you could also see in uh, which directions um, the, um, the fire went. Uh, those were essential data. Uh, what made us really helpful in that case was that we had done, in fact, a lot of training together with the authorities. So in particular, in, uh, in the Grunewald, we um, benefited a lot from the fact that we had done joint, um, uh, joint um, stages already where we worked together uh, so that everybody knew whom to address and that it was pretty clear on um, what the um, hotlines in case of emergency were, how to reach people, how to get into contact, um, and, uh, and how to get the data used so that um, it could be used best. In case of Turkey, that was, of course, much more difficult because um, the area was much more complex. It took quite a long more time, and we saw that it's really essential um, to have um, a plan and to have quite a lot of plans, in fact, in order to be able uh, to adapt um, to the situation. And that's, in fact, a real challenge, because that means that um, you have to um, have proper preparation for these kinds of emergencies. In the ARTA, we were pretty lucky, because um, we, at that time, had a helicopter just equipped for a research mission with the right sensors. And that was pure luck, 
and we really hope that your authorities have learned uh, from that fact and uh, that it's, it's going to be um, helicopters with that kind of equipment or planes with that kind of equipment um, that uh, will be there in future available in case of any of these kinds of catastrophes um, in addition to the satellite data. Thank um, you. Because that gives you a lot more local resolution. Thank you, Anke. Phil, picking up on what Anke just said and what has been said before about the lack of human capital, the lack of people on the ground able to process the data. I know that you had a very long career in operational forecasting. Can you comment on this? Are there are any other inputs that you heard from session two that you can comment on? I, I think generally the point, uh, it's probably two points that are most important. Uh, the first one is uh, I think people are, end users are very often um, uh, drowning in data and starving for information. So I don't think the... Yeah, definitely, some of the issue is the right human capital, the people with the right experience, the people with the skills to use data. But I think there's a, there's a, more, fundamental, there's a more fundamental issue, and particularly uh, in, in crises and emergency events. M more information does not make decision-making quicker or easier or often better. Um, so I think there's a critical issue for, for the space community and for other communities that we need to start with the decisions that the people are making um, and think about how we can support those decisions that people are making in the best possible way. Because it's only when someone makes a decision based on the data that we're providing that actually a benefit to society occurs. So I think that's, that's, that's really important. Now, we all know that understanding user requirements is, is important, and you've heard that a lot today. I think the surprising thing for me, and I've worked with emergency responders for 10 years, is even though you work closely with them, you think you know the decisions they make and the information they want, and actually it's very, it's very easy to be mistaken with all the best intention in the world. It's hard work to really understand what end users want and need, and I think that's important. That's, that's important for us as a community to really get to the bottom of that. This is very good input. Some very good feedback from the previous session. Actually, we struggle to understand end users. Uh, uh, Eric, please. Yeah, I want to add to what Phil and Chris have been saying. And, and we've, heard, we've heard so many things about the end user and understanding their needs. And I think the first challenge that we have is really a communication challenge really going to understand, because it's, it's not just about information, as you point out, it's about the right information. Not too much, but the right information. Um, and I think that when we, when we understand that, and uh, I, I think when we were talking about the law enforcement example, or deforestation, there's the whole value chain, or, or now it looks more like a tree than a chain, because there's many uh, inputs and many outputs, but we need to understand that, and we need to connect better. But the thing is, um, and I've been using that, that phrase a few times, is I consider space agencies to be the space solution architects. So, but architects go to the client and figure out what, <laughs> what they want in the end. So even the end user shouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion. If they, you know, some have the knowledge and skill set to do so, but they shouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's higher resolution, higher frequency. It, it may not be the short-term solution, it may be the longer-term solution, but we need to understand what they're going to use it for, and then we can do a better job at making sure that we understand them and we go forward with solutions. So a bit of lack of communication between the two sides. I would say improvement. Okay. Not necessarily <laughs> lack, but certainly improvement. Lionel, what's your point? Yes, you know, uh, yes, we have to listen to the end users, but the end users are, are changing a lot because at the beginning we, we were used to, to work with very small communities devoted to one space system. We have a, a satellite, a ground segment, a community, and that's it. And, and, and silos like this. Mm -hmm. And people were, were okay with that. Huh? And now change are, are, uh, things are changing a lot and we have to work with with wider and wider communities, and we have to interact with these communities, which is not so easy for us, because we were used to, to work with small communities ag again. Mm -hmm. And then it is a new, a new métier, a new job, to, to, to work with these new communities, to, to, to hear from them, and to work on the, on the new systems. And that's a very important uh, work we are doing at agencies level. One thing asked this morning was, do we, do we need more satellites? 
uh, I will say yes. Uh, we are working on that, and we need because we can do much more than we do now with uh, with uh, new satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, at Kness, we are very, very involved in a lot of uh, worldwide cooperation for SWAT, for instance, which is a new satellite for oceanography. Uh, Canadian Space Agency is involved, UKC is involved, and we have a, 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 an historical cooperation on that with uh, GPL and NASA. And it's, it will change the world. It has been launched. Uh, in December, so we will have soon the, 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 the first images, and you will see it will change the world to measure the sea measurement and also to address the level of the fresh water all around the planet. Not only the sea and the ocean, but on, on also the fresh water, which is very new from space. So we, knew we need new measurements, but not only measurement and complex system, uh, but uh, with building this system, we worked from the, from the very beginning, speaking about SWAT, for instance with users, with end users, try to understand what the, the, the needs they have in order to, to answer not only to the science community, which is very important, the basis maybe, but very important, but not only to end users, to what they need and how we can tune the system to answer also their needs. That's very important. Thank you, Lionel. Aina, anything to add that something that resonated with you from session two? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this uh, understanding the user needs um, because uh, we have seen that at, uh, at UNOSAT. Uh, in the beginning, you know, we were doing like a one-week training and uh, that didn't work at all. Uh, so now what we do is that we provide people uh, sitting with the government agencies for three years. That way we learn from them and they learn from us. And I think that's, uh, that's sort of the a golden rule here. You have to be able to, to understand the user needs and there's no one says fits all. So I think that would be my, my comment to this, yeah. Thank you very much. Anything else that we want to add that is a response to the end user struggle from session two? Um, I, I think, uh, well, Eric mentioned it, the, the principle of a value chain. And this is something that we worked on uh, intensively uh, in our space agency for, for the domestic uses, for maritime surveillance and, and also uh, in regards to NICFI, the monitoring of, of a tropical rainforest. So, uh, you know, it comes to mind that with all these elements, and uh, as you say, it's, it's very complex. It's not just a value chain, it's a value tree uh, with many end users. So you really have to perceive a, a balanced value chain because you, you may have a lot of emphasis on the data sourcing or a lot of the emphasis on the on, on the, uh, uh, say, end user um, uh, charts, uh, uh, data, but, but there's so many things in between, and you actually start with education, and as our minister said, you know, you, you, you really have to, to have a holistic picture to this. You, you start with education because in the end, you, the end user will have to have the education to actually be able to use this. Uh, if you emphasize in one part of the value chain because you can't, you may end up forgetting the other parts. And it, it has to do with so many things, actually communicating, uh, how are you actually going to support this? Through funding, you need to have a sound business case because in the end, someone will have to earn money on this. So, so there's so many elements, and I, I think it's important not to dive into, well, the end user is important, but why is it a problem for the end user? Have you really a root cause for that? And then I really think you, you, ha you need to look into the holistic perspective on this. Yes, Anke. Yeah, actually, I, I would also uh, want to emphasize a point that Lionel made, that um, in case of um, the uh, response organization, they often ask quite some change uh, of, of personnel. So uh, what would really need to be in place is structures, and, and those structures really need to be established well. And, and you said that already, uh, you need a lot of training for that, but we need to be clear as a space community also what our job is and what not our job is, and we, are not, we cannot do the job. Um, the uh, governments have to do. Yeah, we can just tell them, okay, this is what we can do, and at the moment you have to take action. And I think we have to be pretty clear on that because we can't solve the issue, and we can just help to, um, uh, to relieve people uh, with respect to um, uh, the problems um, at hand. Thank you. Phil. Uh, thanks. I was just actually going to add a little bit to what Lionel said. There's, there's a quote from Henry Ford where he said, um, if I'd asked what customers wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, so it's about <laughs> understanding customers and the decisions they're making. Them. It's an intelligent engagement. It's not, it's not necessarily, sometimes it is doing what they want, sometimes it's understanding what they need. 
because one of the challenges in the space sector is we're trying to bridge a huge gulf between some incredibly complicated science and engineering to, in the case of emergencies, people on the ground who are deal, dealing with you know, flooding houses and you know, very much at the, at the, 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 the nitty-gritty end. And that, it's hard to bridge that gulf. The other, the other point I just wanted to make is just to stress that the, the ecosystem, the value chain, is, is, quite, is quite complex. And if I can use weather forecasting and severe warning as, a, as an example, that's my background. So um, the sorts of um, Earth observations that uh, organizations like UMEDSAT and other um, meteorological satellite agencies in the world generate uh, accounts for about 60 to 70% of the accuracy of forecast models. And forecasting in Europe contributes about 60 billion a year to the economy. So it does an awful lot, and most of that comes from satellites. But it's the synthesis of satellite data, in situ measurements, understanding of impacts, an awful lot of science, and an awful lot of modeling. It's a huge amount of synthesis from multiple expertise areas, multiple activities that lead to a service that have a big impact. So sometimes what you want is a, is a, is a simple value chain from satellite data, but sometimes it isn't. Thank you. So I'm going to throw an oddball at all of you. <laughs> Unscripted question. Um, so in the previous set, and then I'm going to wrap up the first part, and then we're going to move on our climate solutions for climate action now. But so some of the um, emerging points from the session before was that uh, collaboration is needed. Some platform, some way to share global data. However, sometimes when I observe the market, it seems that we still have strong national interest. We launch our own satellites, we do our own data collection, and then whoever is left out is left out. I would like to have a national and a sovereign national perspective on this. What do you think about these issues? It's just uh, the wrong perception. We're going the right direction. We are going in the wrong direction. There are other forces at place. Who wants to take it? <laughs> Otherwise, I will call. <laughs> Aina, let's have an international perspective. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to, to understand this. Um, um, from our perspective, as I said, we try to do a lot of training and capacity development because it starts really there. Uh, if you're going to have an impact at the local level, you have to work with the, the national governments and uh, the local entities. So for me, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what we are doing. So I think we have uh, lots to, to offer uh, in this discussion. So uh, for me, that's uh, really important. Lionel, yeah. national uh, perspective. In, in space, we, we worked a lot on uh, competition. You know? It's a, it's a word between cooperation and competition. Mm -hmm. Because we, we know all that uh, we are in uh, competition and maybe a stronger and stronger competition now. And, but space is all, it's also a field for cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are some, some domains that are more propice to cooperation, exploration, for, for instance, but the future of our one planet, I think, must be a cooperation uh, purpose. And okay, we have competition in space between countries, uh, between firms, but for this specific area, which is our future, our common future, I think we must all work to be in, in cooperation. That's Thank important. you, Christian. Yeah, you mentioned strong national interests. I think that is true. But at the same time, uh, most nations do not have their own sources, for instance, on Earth observation data like Norway. So we are bound to either buy data or cooperate on, through institutional programs. And in the previous panel, it was mentioned uh, competition, uh, collaboration, and convergence. You know, it, and, and you, you can feel you know, what's, what's in, uh, in, in that. And I think that the um, institutional programs may satisfy the national needs, but you will need to have some kind of income on that. I think it's a paradox. Uh, we're talking about the, 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 uh, the uh, issue from the Maldives. They are lacking high precision data. This is available. I mean, you have 20 centimeter resolution, you have 30 centimeter resolution also on the commercial level. So why isn't that available for, for the Maldives? Is it because it's prioritized otherwise? So I, I think this is all convoluted. It's tied together because so far you have an emerging uh, industry of commercial Earth, uh, Earth observations, uh, satellite owners, builders, operators. But at the same time, it's hard to earn money. So if the Maldives, if the data is there, you have 30 centimeter resolution, you know, 
uh, they're not earning money, that means that they don't have a customer, right? So there's a the customer, mm -hmm. Maldives. They are, er, you know, they're lacking data. So why isn't this happening? Mm -hmm. Why? Maybe this is lack of money on the Maldives. Maybe it's the international community that doesn't grasp this. Like, for instance, Nikfi saying, okay, this is a good idea to have 30 centimeter resolution on the Maldives. So we'll buy this and we'll apply that in a foreign aid program or something. There is something there because I appreciate that maybe not everything is covered, but I really think from the statement that 80% of Earth observation data goes to archive. Well, use it for something. Well, and then someone needs to buy it and apply it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anke, please. Yeah, I, I absolutely concur what you said, Christian. Um, I would just like to, um, uh, was to say that, um, of course, contracts need to be capped. So for certain satellites and satellite data, there is contracts because there are business models behind it. There's, for instance, PPP models. Uh, so, and those are contracts. And you must keep contracts. Um, the other part where it's difficult, of course, is um, data for defense applications. Uh, so, I mean, it's absolutely clear that that would be something uh, that you're not going to share with, uh, with everybody. Huh? So you're going to share it with your lights, but probably not with everybody. So um, that would be also a source of data that is uh, kind of um, not really open to share. Uh, but the research data, so that, that is um, open for sharing as long as that does belong to oneself, uh, one can share it, which is what we do. Um, but um, what I think this community has not, um, or what, what this community does a lot, is really share the data based on the, uh, on the archive, for instance, what we do. Um, and then people put in proposals to use the data. And, uh, and I think that's, that's pretty similar to what other communities do. For instance, the Synchrotron community does the same thing. So you are allowed to keep your data um, proprietary for a certain time, and then you have to share it. Uh, for somebody who uses it. So, um, and, uh, and, and I think these kind of models um, where you really share open, uh, research data is a really good thing, and I think most of us do that anyway with all our research data. Yeah, Mick. Just quickly, um, I think the future is, lies in the balance. Mm. In the balance, of because we're going to have commercial sources, we're going to have uh, international partnerships, and we're going to have open and free and the need for sovereign systems as well, for, for many different reasons. Um, so it's a combination of everything there that the future missions, the future data collection systems are going to have to take, care, take into account all of that. And we can't forget that there's a question of data sovereignty and, uh, and it's, it's, it's evolving as well. Like in, in Canada, I know that we, the First Nations have a principles to apply um, uh, data sovereignty and that we have to respect. And so all of that needs to, again, better communication, but it's, it's centered around, I think the future will lie between you know, public good information, mm -hmm. public good type of services versus commercially viable uh, mm -hmm. and, and ad adventures. Thank you very much, Rick. I'm going to stay with you because I think now we can shift to the second part and let's actually discuss space as a toolbox from climate action now. I think now we can discuss about some concrete examples of what are national entities, sovereign national entities doing to tackle some specific local, global humanitarian issues. So over to you. Well, thank you. And uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit of a program that we have at the Space Agency. It's called Smart Earth. Um, but the, what it does, it's, cater, it's catering to applications. It's developing applications with different ways. In, in some ways, like I said, it's public good, so therefore the government has a need and puts out a call and receives uh, offers and basically people that will want to solve that, that challenge. And other times it's a question of fostering just uh, helping out some of the users or some of the service providers to be able to develop some key applications. And I just want to name two, uh, um, highlight two examples of that. In the north, we talked about ice this morning, um, ice melting. Well, there's people living in, on the ice, making a living out of the ice, uh, going fishing and hunting. Ice safety is a key issue. Mm -hmm. So now, basically, there's, there's a, an Arctic uh, uh, organization that is uh, fusing 
basically local data as well as uh, the radar sat constellation mission data in order to send people on their uh, mobile applications, basically send them ICE information about the safety. Is this traditional route still safe or not? And that is food security. So it's, it's having an impact right away on the communities there. The other example that I have is um, uh, we talked also about biodiversity and climate is changing, habitats are moving and evolving. So although we may not be able to, from space, measure uh, every, every animal, every disease vectors and everything, we can certainly have, an, uh, have a view of the habitat and how it's changing. We have an initiative that was basically sent as a challenge. Can we do something about tracking whales from space? Can we do something that's very concrete? Because the, the uh, North Atlantic right whale is in danger of extension. We need to protect it, but we don't know where it goes. So we're trying to ascertain the habitats, or even if there is a way to do that, track um, whales. And by the way, there was, uh, there was a possibility, they, they identified a single individual whale uh, from space not, not too long ago, but that's not necessarily practical. But why are we doing this? To protect the whale, to understand the environment, but not knowing where the whales are in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, basically ask every shipping uh, vessel to slow down, every cruise vessel to slow down, to the point where they're no longer stopping on the small village or the small city along the coast. They brought tourism, they brought economy to the regional. So space can help and has repercussion in all that chain. And I would say there. also tracking one single whale from space is quite powerful, <laughs> technologically <laughs> speaking. Thank you very much. Lionel. Well, you, you, you talked about thinking global and, and local, and, 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 and it's very important, I think, to, to, to think both. Uh, first, global. It's a strength. We have to understand that it's a strength of space domain to, to, to think and to see, to observe, to analyze, to analyze things globally. For tens thousands of years, women and men were stuck to the surface of the Earth without any possibility to see the Earth itself uh, as a whole. And, and, and space allows that. So it's very important, and, and again, it's, it's a game changer because all the scientists can analyze the Earth as, as, as one object. It, it changes a, a lot of things. And again, I, I, I take the example of the sea level. I, I mentioned SWOT, but we have a long history of cooperation in that domain. For more than 30 years, we measure the sea level with a very good precision. And the average we measure for 30 years, 3.2 millimeter per year, uh, is an average on the, on the Earth. It, it, one couldn't mm -hmm. measure that, calculate that, measuring the, the level of the sea in one place and another place, because in one place it's, it's going up very uh, uh, um, more, and in another place it's going down. So we don't understand anything. You point, so this global view is very important and is given by space. And it's very important for scientific to understand the planet and the system Earth. And I think it's a basis of a lot of things. But at the same time, if you think to, to one guy, a politician, or to, to, who has to, to take decisions, there is a, an average mean, a mean of 3.2 millimeters per year, and so on. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, if you think we, you, you have a good probability to, lo to lose your house within 10 years if you don't see it. Then uh, they that, will understand. That, uh, uh, this is another story. Mm -hmm. And this is very local. And so we have to work, and we can do that, at global view and also at very local view. And mm -hmm. uh, um, we, 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 we created a, a, a project uh, called SCO, Space Climate Observatory at CNES. We are now uh, 36 uh, members, tonight 38, two will sign uh, uh, two days, uh, which is exactly the, the, the case. Not to see globally, which is very important and the basis, but to see very locally and to build projects at local uh, level, with space data, with in-situ data, with scientists working together with scientific approach, to concretely, very concretely, and very locally explain to people what are the impact of the global change if we don't 
take the right decisions. And even what has the impact if we take this decision, this decision or this decision. It is very important and we can do that. And for, for, for example, uh, just uh, uh, one of these projects is called Flood, is uh, in the south of France. They, they were impacted by very catastrophic floods in uh, 2018. And they, they, they have to understand, they ask us to understand where was the damage, how are the damage, what are the main problems uh, created by this uh, disaster, and how we can think the uh, reconstruction. And, and, and it is not the reconstruction, but also the restructuring mm -hmm. of uh, the land management to tackle with that in the future. Mm -hmm. And we can do that very concretely at this place, at this very place, uh, 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 with, uh, with the space data. And the magic of space is that we can go back to global, because when you have a solution in one place, with the satellite data, you, you have also the, the yes. data at the same time to tackle this problem in another place. And here another example is maybe another project of SCO, which is called Tropisco. Tropisco is a deforestation of tropical forest. We, we talked about that this morning, which is very important. And then we are we, we were working on that in Amazonia. The French Guiana is very impacted with that. We have with Tropisco uh, near real time of the deforestation. Every week, we have a new situation, and we can follow exactly the deforestation and the impact. But when we have worked on that in French Guiana, in, in Amazonia, you have the same solution in, in the Republic of Gabon. We work on that okay. within so Tropisco. It's on, with uh, 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 Asia also, we have the same thing. And so we go back to the global view, but with local impact, which is very important for the people and for the politician to take the good decisions. Very interesting, and uh, thank you very much. Also pointing out how if you communicate and information speak about subsidence, it doesn't have the same impact that if you say you're gonna lose your house in 10 years. So very interesting point. Anke, over to you. Yeah, actually I um, think um, connecting to what Leonard said, actually the point about um, the global view and the local view, I think the uh, climate models of course um, have to be global at first, and then, of course, you can go down to regions. And, and, and there, space makes a huge impact on the verification of models. And that's, um, that's a, a major um, um, advantage of satellite data, that you get it globally, that you really can verify models. You can't do that with any, with, uh, any other methods. Um, however, I think uh, regarding local data, we have also now the benefit to combine lots of data. So we have optical data, we have radar data, um, uh, we have, for instance, hyperspectral data. And, uh, and that allows us really to look at individual regions of high interest um, in very much detail. And, uh, and I think that's in particular important now that we have the climate crisis because uh, besides um, all the impacts we have, like flooding, we also have the question about plant illness, plant health. Um, we have the question about, um, uh, about forests and forest degradation due to um, uh, tree illnesses, which we have to tackle, which has been a huge disaster in Northern Europe. And, uh, and we also have to find out what the right uh, agricultural techniques are going to be for various regions of the Earth. And there, of course, for instance, hyperspectral data, which gives you um, information about plant diseases, is going to play a huge part. And the same is true, of course, uh, there also for um, humidity gradients you can measure in the soil using hyperspectral data. So. Um, also new kinds of sensors and the, um, uh, the fusion of different sensor data is going uh, to make a huge impact in battling the effects of climate change. Thank you, Björn. Einar. Yeah, so um, I would say that um, from my side, from Eurosat's side, we work on two fronts here, um, both uh, in terms of rapid mapping uh, but also uh, where we collaborate with the International uh, Charter Space and Major Disasters, uh, of which many here are, are members of. But um, we also do a lot of training and capacity development in the countries. So for me, that is uh, where we have to, to really uh, see how we can do better. Um, before we, at UNOSAT, huh, we, we tried with a, a one-week training course that didn't work at all. Um, so what we are doing now is that we are really... Um, but tell us what went wrong, actually. <laughs> no, it doesn't lead anywhere. Okay. okay. You have no results. All right. 
No, uh, there's no capacity development in doing this. Um, mm. uh, so, so what? Uh, yeah. So, so um, what we are doing now, as I said, is that we we put people together with the government in the countries, and we are working together with them. So they learn from us, and we learn from them. Um, but um, we also got uh, this um, uh, nice product called Common Sensing, financed by the UK Space Agency a couple of years back, um, for Fiji, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands. And this is where we really we learned a lot. Um, and now, thanks to NORAD, we have added Bangladesh, Laos, Bhutan, Uganda, and Nigeria to this. So what um, we try to develop together now uh, is to, to, for the government to be in the lead, and also making sure that um, uh, the, the, uh, they get the, uh, the geospatial solutions that they need. But in my view, you know, you don't, they don't need to know how to analyze satellite imagery. So what we have to do is to just, uh, what I call, just Spotify it. Um, so it, if I, I need to listen to jazz, uh, I love jazz. Maybe you don't, but uh, <laughs> I like it. It's good, it's good. <laughs> I'm not judgmental. No, no, no. <laughs> but um, I don't know how to need how to make jazz, right? Because my Stavis has already made lots of great jazz, jazz music. So that is also, you know, uh, how we want to work with the governments. So we have to develop tools that are directly supporting their needs. And there's no one-size-fits-all. So what we do in terms of, of, um, of uh, um, capacity development is that we, we work closely with the governments and um, uh, we, we develop tools for them. One such tool, as is talking about implementation here, is what to have a climate planning uh, relocation tool. And um, this tool is... Um, um, is operated by um, the, the government, but we do all the underlying uh, data and data gathering, so that in, when it comes to, to different factors that they will factor in, um, it's their they call. So um, f typically we do this for, for um, coastal flood and, and um, topical cyclones, um, and it's very uh, telling when you see this uh, uh, at the dashboard. Um, so, basically, what we're doing then is that um, uh, we, we listen to the governments, uh, and they are really in the lead, and they dis discuss with their local communities. So, that is something that we have seen work very well, and uh, this is now being used operationally. So, in Fiji now, they are moving villages based on this tool. Um, another important aspect um, um, is, is for SIDS, uh, small island development states, is to be um, are most successful uh, in, in meeting uh, climate change uh, finance. Uh, traditionally, they don't have uh, very much uh, success in this, and um, that's why we are treating um, uh, this um, uh, to really help them access climate funding. And here we work also uh, very very closely with the, with the, um, the Commonwealth Secretariat and their climate uh, finance access hub. Also, I would, uh, if you allow me, I would just also like to, to tell something about flood AI that we have developed. Very briefly. Hmm? <laughs> uh, Six words. Oh, that's too long. <laughs> I don't have eight. <laughs> so we can go back to yeah. la later to that. Phil, what's your perspective? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I sometimes think that in many cases, this a global regional is a false dichotomy. Often regional actions, which are often the actions that make a difference, happen within a global context or a global framework. Um, and, and in a sense, one of the, uh, as Linnell said, one of the advantages of space is it operates both uh, globally and locally and between the two. I mean, just, uh, I think you, you asked for an example, I think um, a specific one that's, that's relevant to what we do. We all know, uh, particularly in the light of the most recent uh, IPCC assessment report, um, severe, severe weather impacts are increasing in every region of the world in all sorts of different ways. So they're becoming more of a challenge. Certain types of severe weather event are very, very difficult to forecast using computer models. The very intense localized uh, rain systems that can cause uh, you know, loss of life, severe flooding, very difficult to forecast. Um, so uh, we recently launched uh, Meteosat third generation, next generation of geostationary satellite at the end of last year. 
which incidentally is a success story of collaboration in Europe between ESA and industry. So you <laughs> know where I stand on collaboration. Um, but, but, but the focus of that is to provide imagery um, over one hemisphere of the globe um, every two and a half minutes. So you can see intense, intense weather develop really quickly and you're able to provide better warnings. Stepping back from the regional, uh, that, that satellite is also observing Africa where there are very few in situ observations and not a lot of observational capacity. And, and we're able to work with African weather services to allow them to use the data in the same way that we would in Europe to do a better job in protecting their societies. Thank you very much. Christian, over to you. Some concrete examples. Yes, and uh, uh, what was mentioned earlier also was that there is no size fits all. So I think that if you have a good local case from a, uh, a domestic challenge that you need to solve uh, and, and see and, and try to investigate how that can be applied for other use cases, but with a twist. Um, in Norway, we, we uh, started off this um, uh, uh, Barents Watch program about 10 years ago, and it, it says in the name, it's pretty obvious, you know, you, you want to watch the Barents Sea. It's a, a GIS-based system with uh, uh, algae bloom, uh, fishery, maritime traffic, and it's totally adopted to uh, Norwegian coastal interest. Uh, and we are seeing now that uh, uh, with the event now with uh, more rad uh, radar coverage, more AIS coverage of uh, seagoing vessels, um, and as you say, you know, I mean, this is by nature a, local, uh, a global system. This can also be applied in other countries for monitoring of illegal fishery. It's, ex you know, uh, it's an exceedingly uh, important problem illegal fishery, it, it's, uh, it's a, a huge black economy. And we are seeing that with the, with the, with the um, technologies, the software, the applications that we are developing for Norway, we can actually apply that, say, on a global scale, but for other different nations that have different needs but tied to a similar question, tied to the sustainability of their daily life in terms of fishery. So acting local, applying global. Thank you very much. Somebody wants to add something? Okay, I'm going to ask one last question and then I'm going to pick up some questions from the audience. The last question for you is if you have to define how a space climate action plan, what would be the most important point? If you have to have one point only on your space climate action plan and your one point only has to have only six words. <laughs> Challenge. <laughs> I didn't tell you. Sorry, it's for the audience. <laughs> Christian, you're opening the floor. Uh. I could do it in four words. Wow, Is that go good? for it. Yeah. Yes. A strategic communication plan. Okay. I, do you want me to elaborate? Yes. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, I mean, it's, it's been talked about all day. I mean, you, you, you have all these solutions, but how are you actually going to implement? And I, this is also something we've talked about. How, who are you actually going to talk to? Who, who is going to listen more? To, to you know all the great solutions for from from industry, I mean you have the stakeholders, you have existing players who's who's doing what now to 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 have excessive uh, collaborations. You need to understand our politicians' ambitions and goals. What are they actually trying to implement? Um, you need to establish continuous dialogue. It's not only having one conference. This is challenging enough, but you really need to have a continued dialogue addressing the people, and you need to understand the full uh, value change. So, and also, it's been mentioned so many, time, uh, so many times today, engaging the end users, that's also part of the a total communication plan. So, I could go on on, on different things, mapping, mapping available resources and, and the, the needs of the end user society, but this is how difficult it is to, to view this in, in a total context. But at the bottom of this, in order, I mean, we have all the tools. We have all the data. We can develop software, but communicating and spreading the word and understanding the value chain with all these different elements. So easy to say and so dif difficult to do. Challenging. Eric, your single point uh, space climate action plan. Well, since Christian took care the of communication the communication one. plan, <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll just add something for the short term portion of that plan. I think it's fostering applications to support the full chain, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> maybe one, one word too many. Um, and just to elaborate, it's because we heard it that we need to engage with other sectors. We, we can't just keep it space. If we want the end results, basically that those, those actions, those applications, those tools that we're talking about, 
we need to not be blind that there might be vehicles, ships, or something else in order to put that to large benefits. So that's really the key, is that we need to have that perspective and involve whoever uh, and communicate with, uh, with, uh, with them as well. Thank you very much. Lionel. Uh, you know, a lot of things to do, but if I have to choose uh, one thing, I think we have to, to focus on the monitoring of uh, Paris Agreement now. We have this agreement, but the announcements are very good. To commit is uh, necessary, but, but we have to check the realization of the actions, and, and once again, uh, the impact of this action. We have to check that. And so, uh, if I may, we, because we are speaking about toolbox, uh, 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 from space, uh, with the space uh, domain. I think space can help a lot to check at global level for all the countries. And so what I would like to have in this toolbox is an anti-blabla tool <laughs> based on space capacity. <laughs> Going back to this morning, thank you very much. Anke, over to you, what's your single point? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just, uh, yeah, uh, I would say um, be clear and honest about uh, chances and uh, limits. So, I mean, of course, it's a bad thing if you talk before me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's particularly important to say what, in fact, space can contribute and what it can't. Uh, so, uh, uh, actions have, been, have to be made on Earth. And, uh, and I think it was an important point um, that Lionel already made that I would like to... Um, um, make even um, yeah show on an example. I think it's really important um, to follow up on actions, and that means uh, also to look, for instance, at point sources of emissions now, not only at globally at emissions, but also at point sources, and to really identify also um, uh, more locally uh, where the problems are. And uh, and I think on the other hand, of course, we have lots of chances because we can improve, for instance, agriculture. Um, uh, looking at um, at a small uh, at more small field agriculture, where we can take um, advantage of various soil qualities of not using too much um, of uh, uh, various um, things to keep plants healthy and to keep them growing, growing, but to just use the right amount. So, so there are lots of chances, but um, the uh, actions have to be taken on earth. Thank you, Anke. Einar, just six words. AI. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's quite effective. <laughs> yeah. uh, six words, more than one idea. <laughs> um, uh, user needs, collaboration, and data platforms. If you want six words and one idea, it would be re reducing friction for data discovery and application. Okay, thank you very much. We have four minutes. I'm going to start to take some questions from the audience. There are way more than we can tackle all together, but um, let me address the first one, which is uh, interesting. I think we all agree on this answer. So far, I've only heard about responding to symptoms of climate change and not treating the wound. We need to reduce our emissions. How are we focusing on this? Uh, so just to say, tomorrow is going to be the entire day on CO2 emission methods. So we are actually tracking that. But maybe you guys want to elaborate on this? Yes. I, was it, uh, I just a quick point. Um, when we're talking about climate change and dealing with it, we come from a, a, you know, a very scientific and technical point of view. To, to, to um, get engagement with climate change, we need to appeal to hearts and minds. And the imagery that comes from satellites, data, the views, the, the, the demonstration of what climate change has done, whether that's sea level rise or shrinking lakes, is something that appeals to hearts, and that's very important. Thank you very much. Well, yes. just, just one thing, if we're expecting us to do something to reduce emission, that's a different subject, but there's three categories. There, there's people out there that, that fight the causes, there's people out there that fight the impacts, and others that are uh, looking at adaptation and preparedness. So all of these require data, information. That's... The really, the, that's where we play a role, is we gather the information and we need to be able to transform it so that it's actionable. That's our... Very good point, thank you, Eric. Mm. Actually, one, one point is also that um, if you talk about it and that, I, and, and that uh, we have to take action to reduce emissions, that's also a question, of course, about our organizations, uh, about the sustainability of our own organizations. Uh, and that's a point where we 
uh, need to walk the talk. Huh? So um, it's often uh, quite tedious, but that's also something I guess all of us do. To, yep. right. Go crazy. Well, in terms of, for instance, reducing the emission, mm -hmm. I think um, you know, regulatory action, this is something that has been done already. You, you have to have some kind of public uh, re regulatory framework for industry who is challenged by this, but you also have to have an incentive tool in order to make it profitable, more profitable to follow the regulations. Thank you very much. Lionel. Three very concrete examples about the, the, the tracking of emissions. Uh, we are on the table now uh, developing projects and linked to cooperation because we have Yazi NG, which is an instrument to, tackle, to, to measure more than 20 gases in the atmosphere in cooperation with Umetsat. Um, uh, microcarb uh, in cooperation with UKAC to measure CO2 uh, emission in preparation uh, at, at CNES. And Merlin in cooperation with DLR uh, for, for methane. So we, we are developing projects to, 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 to tackle, to measure these emissions. Very interesting. Okay. Another question. More satellites, the near-Earth environment becomes more polluted and extensively crowded and unsafe. How are we going to decide what is allowed and valuable in LEO and GEO? This is a very uh, popular topic. We all know that. Uh, maybe not so strictly related to climate change on Earth, but still related to sustainability. Anybody wants to address this issue? Nobody wants to. Yes, you know, we, 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 are, we are working on that. It's a, it's a, it's an it's an issue. It's a, it's a real problem. We have worked on that for for a very long times. We have a an international organization called Interagency Debris Committee working on that mm -hmm. uh, topics and mm -hmm. to to define uh, uh, um, guidelines yeah. laws. It's not law at a worldwide level. We have a law in France for that, mm -hmm. but it's guidelines at worldwide level. We want to go on uh, in this direction, but we are working uh, early on that to, to explain to people what is possible to do and what is not possible to do, not only in terms of number of satellites in such orbit, but how to deal with the satellites, how to monitor the satellites, how to deorbit the satellite at the end of life, and so on. So we are working on that. It's very important. Thank you very much, Lionel. Yeah, I mean, the discussion is, is going on how fast can we develop the international treaties for, for providing a framework around this. Personally, I think, and this is not only my thought, that uh, the, uh, the, the industry is developing much faster than the treaties can. So I think that there is an element of self-regulation, that the industry is now, together with users, acknowledging that this doesn't work. And this, uh, the, the complement to that is the development of space traffic management, uh, space surveillance and tracking that you can actually deorbit and control and actually uh, sort of harness the total amount of, uh, of satellites in LEO and, and MEO. Thank and you that, very much. And oh. that's a collective need, yeah, right? Of course. Yeah. No matter if you want to profit from it or for public good, the interest is in keeping that usable, sustainable. For everyone, absolutely. I'm going to close down because we are 23 seconds after the limit. Thank you very much to all our fantastic panelists. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.